Welcome back, everyone. We are in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, the last section there. So let's read it and uh, see what we can understand. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 39. Somebody read it. Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for it, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two as three witnesses. Of how much sorrow punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and had counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that had said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Partly while you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which had great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saying of the soul, saving of the soul. Okay. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. That was a long passage, uh, but you read it through. Uh, so here in this section, we are looking at a situation where one is choosing to sin willfully. And uh, the author is saying uh, there remains no other sacrifice that can uh, cleanse us. Yes, Jesus has done it all. But when one is sinning willfully, repeatedly, somewhat like the Hebrew 6 situation, over there, it talked about uh, the state of completely falling away going away from God. Uh, whereas over here, it is talking about somebody who is headed or not too far from that place of falling away where they are living a sinful life. And also, you know, it, it, uh, it, it looks like they are rejecting and disregarding the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's what the author is saying. Isn't it? He's saying that uh, uh, it's as if one has, uh, okay, I'll read verse 29. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has, and notice this is the way he's describing the sin that has been committed, trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. So is he talking about a believer? Yes, he is talking about a believer because he, he states counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. So there is a believer who has experienced the goodness of God, the saving uh, you know, grace of God, the redemption of God, and such a person is now caught in willful repeated sin and when one does so what does that look like it is as if we are trampling the son of god underfoot or in other words 
disgracing uh, Jesus. Uh, we we are dishonoring Jesus. We are not valuing the work that He has done on the cross for us. So uh, you know it's a very dangerous situation where yes. The book of Hebrews, we've understood Jesus has done this. This is who Jesus is. He's God, he's man, he's exalted, he's a high priest, he's the high priest, whatever. Everything we've understood, but we don't value it because the life that we live does not value what we know about the Lord Jesus. And so he's talking uh, about such a person and he's saying, look, there are consequences, right? So the people under the, the Mosaic covenant, if they sin and they had a punishment, he has stated this, uh, you know, this the same way of communicating earlier as well. That if those who did not obey, right, the the children of Israel, if they faced consequences, how much more us? And so we now under the new covenant must be that much more um, alert not to give up on this, this valuable salvation which has been given to us. And, you know, uh, we, we are also uh, told here about the nature of God, where God is saying, um, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord will judge his people. So there is a picture of God uh, which may not be discussed quite often in the Christian circles for whatever reason, but the same God of grace is also the God of truth. He's also the God of justice. He's also the God of righteousness. So his justice aspect is revealed here where God says that when we treat his work of redemption lightly and we go against it, we reject it, you know, we are faithless about it, then consequences will fall. He's you know, ultimately, he's a God of justice. And so consequences will follow. And uh, the, the writer wants, yes, we are going through, the uh, listeners were going through discouragement. But he says, uh, because of discouragement, if, if we become passive, if we become, you know, cold to who God is and the things of God, uh, it's a dangerous place. And we could even open ourselves to sin. You know, it's uh, often said that, for a believer, there are two seasons where we must be very, very careful, where we might be vulnerable to uh, the, uh, uh, you know, attacks is a strong word, but the influences of Satan. And these two seasons are seasons of great victory and seasons of, of uh, you know, great failure or discouragement. Or you can look at it this way, a high moments when we feel so high. Uh, right and our low moments when we are so low because in both of these times if we we generally tend to to let down our guards and when that happens the enemy knows he can influence us and so we have to be very careful and in the low moments that's what the writer is talking about he's saying uh, don't get into this place of rejecting this valuable sacrifice of jesus and he's warning them because a true teacher, a true mentor uh, will tell, tell the people about the good things as well as the, the scary things. And so in verse 31, he says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a dangerous place to uh, go against God because who are we up against? The God, uh, you know, uh, that, that we have described so far, the great and mighty God. And then he recalls, the journey of these believers. And he says that in their journey, what has now happened as far as his observation is concerned, he says there were days when you were so on fire, okay? But now you no longer seem to have that fire because when the, the fire is there, he says, after you were illuminated or when you were born again, when you tasted this, this salvation, what was your, your uh, uh, you know, how how was your life uh, the way you know we see later on the book of revelation the first love do the works you know, that that have to do with the first love so when these believers were born again that first love is evident in their lives because what were they doing they had uh, struggles they had uh, difficulties but they endured through them uh, they helped others okay uh, he says when i was in chains you joyfully accepted 
um, you know, you you helped me. Basically, that's the point he's making. So they were so on fire that when it was difficult for them, they were ready to help others. So they have been in that season, which was so passionate, but now something has gone wrong. What has gone wrong? Uh, you know, they have been discouraged by uh, circumstances, persecution, you know, losing. Uh, we, we told earlier that these believers, they must have lost property. They must have lost relationships. Uh, they must have been called names. They would have lost rights, uh, government rights, you know, in, in the land because of their newfound faith. The honor which they had under the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Judaic uh, uh, sort of tradition, maybe they lost that. So they are tempted to go back to Judaism. And at that point, the author is telling them, no, 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 Jesus Christ, salvation is so much greater than your early tradition. And he's also warning them and he's saying, if you listen to all this, you know, when we know the truth and then we don't value it anymore. He's saying, come on, that's so dangerous. Uh, and, and willfully continuing in sin is as good as rejecting and even destroying the work of salvation that Jesus has done on the cross. And that's a choice. That's a choice. So he, he uh, literally, he uh, pleads with them. He tells them, don't cast away your confidence in verse 35, uh, which has great reward. So he's calling them to endure. Okay. And uh, I was just reading one particular uh, is it a, a, an article or I don't remember whether it was a video, but then it was talking about a quality that makes people um, you know, so-called successful. So they studied apparently successful people and then uh, they tried to figure out like what is it that is making them successful? And one quality uh, that uh, they pointed out was endurance. Endurance. Because difficult times come to everyone. But this quality of endurance or grit, you know, as, as some people put it, uh, what, does it what, what does it do? It helps a person hold on through those rough patches. See, everyone probably does great when you know, they start, start off a journey. Uh, start off a race, start off uh, uh, an initiative, a venture. But rough patches will be there. You know, difficult uh, parts will be there. But it's the one who endures, who will carry forward to the next phase and the next phase and the next phase up until the finish line. So endurance is a key quality which is required to complete a journey uh, or even to finish well and that's what the author is talking about and it's so important even for us because in our christian work uh, there are you know great seasons the highs uh, and then there are definitely some lows for various reasons but even in those seasons as the author is saying he's saying come on can you hold on don't cast away your confidence don't give up now and he's trying to reassure and he's saying there is a reward if you hold on, you are going to see good things ahead. And then you know, he talks about endurance. He says, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Isn't it so sad that we watch people running cross country, um, marathons. They've come close to the finish line, but for whatever reason, they say, oh, forget it. I'm tired. I don't want to run anymore. So close. But yet, you know, not close enough to complete the journey. That's very sad. Uh, and, and that's what he's telling a, a believer. He said, don't give up. Don't give up. You need some endurance. If you keep running, uh, there is a reward. And you will see that. You will experience that. You have need of en endurance. In verse 37, he's reassuring, encouraging them. He says, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come. And will not tarry. You know, it's like how parents uh, tell kids when uh, uh, you're you're driving. The kids keep asking, right? How far? How much more? How, how much further do we have to go? And the parents say, almost there, almost there, right? The journey is almost over. So it's like that. He's telling the believers, come on, Jesus is coming back, and it's not very far away. Uh, we are going to see, you know, the that glorious existence. Uh, later as well but in this earthly life 
there are struggles don't give up verse 38 now the just shall live by faith but if anyone draws back so he's saying come on you, you got to hold on uh, and you got to have some faith uh, and not give up uh, because if you if you draw back then he's saying my soul has no pleasure in it and no believer wants that we want god to be pleased with us isn't it and if we don't hold on then God will be sad about that. And he said to them, uh, let that not happen. May the Lord continue to be pleased with us. And that's only possible if we walk by faith. Okay. And verse 39, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So again, a lot of warning, tough words. Uh, quoted by some nice words where he's saying oh but i know that you are you are not those kind of people you will be fine you will you know uh, uh, overcome you will make it and, and so encouragement so now that he's brought in the subject of faith okay, he wants to teach the people about the importance of living by faith because what's happening to them you know the reality of the natural world is not encouraging but they need to have faith in god they need to have faith in the promises of god in the nature of god um, and that jesus is coming back that we will experience you know a uh, reward in this lifetime glory uh, in, the, in the coming lifetime uh, and these are all things that they must be established in and when one is established in these things um, it's possible to endure okay so now he'll talk about faith so we're moving on to chapter 11 here and it's a beautiful passage um uh, you know it's a famous famous passage hebrews 11 uh, which enlists for us the lives of people who have overcome by faith and it also uh, uh, puts the you know it, it sheds light on the importance of faith and why is the author talking about this he wants to bring the believer out of the pattern of discouragement he wants to inspire them to faith when a believer has faith he will be able to um, endure through any season so let's get into this chapter uh, in uh, verses one to three uh, could somebody please read it now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things seen not seen for by it the people of old received their com commendation by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of god so that what it what is seen was not made out of things that are visible thank you asha so this uh, chapter will need uh, you know at least 11 hours but we will try to squeeze it into uh, a couple of minutes um, Again, there's depth in every single word there. So what is he pointing to? He's pointing to uh, uh, faith. And faith has a substance. Or we can understand it as a, a sense uh, where, where we say, OK, this is an additional sense. Apart from the senses that a human being carries, this additional sense, it's the substance. Meaning there is an assurance, you know, that, that comes with faith deep within us. While we don't, while we don't see evidence in the natural, in our spirit, we we have a substance. That's what he's saying. So what is faith? He's describing faith as a substance or a sense that a believer has or one has. And he's saying this sense or substance is about the things which are hoped for and in the uh, amplified um, you know we we see that they use the terminology such as title deed and many of us understand that when there is a a, a large purchase that needs to be made you know one um, cannot pay up in full they may give a token amount and you know they they, they are now given the papers or the guarantee of the final purchase is okay, sometimes later uh, but the title deed or the assurance that it is going to come through 
it is going to happen. I know. I have the assurance. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, so faith is the substance of the things hoped for. They are not in existence right now, but we are hoping for them. They are in the future for us. And um, he says, it is the evidence of things not seen. So he's saying that in the natural world, you know, there is, um, or, or in the natural world, the promises that we are trusting God for are still invisible. But in the spiritual world, we have a substance. So we have a grip on a sense within us. Okay. And that is what keeps us grounded. So faith is needed when, um, you know, when we, we, we say that we can't, see we can't touch in the natural uh, there is something deeper and stronger within us that gives us the assurance and then he goes on to talk about the elders obtained a good testimony we will see the set of elders who are the elders remember he's talking to the jewish community and uh, they have uh, great patriarchs they call them patriarchs people like abraham isaac jacob so he lists out all of them and their testimony how they lived by faith uh, and verse 3 he says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of god so was anyone there during the creation of the world just checking with all of us i don't think so you know none of us were there but how do we believe it we believe it by faith right that yes it has happened uh, as uh, the way the word of God says that God created the heavens and the earth with the word that he spoke. And uh, uh, again, it takes faith to believe that the things which became visible or the natural came into existence through the spiritual. Okay. So uh, these are our principles in God's word. And uh, um, as believers, we, we grasp them. And spiritual realities and so now from verse 4 he'll begin to talk about heroes of the faith so let's talk about how uh, they lived and what is it that they have done so let's go ahead um could somebody please read verse 4 uh, by faith evil offered to god a more excellent sacrifice than cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, being dead, still speaks. Amen. Thank you, Christopher. It's very, very uh, beautiful verse. One verse, okay, uh, that describes the sacrifice of Abel. And the life of Abel um, in the Bible is very short-lived. Hardly anything is mentioned uh, in Genesis. You know, there were two brothers, Abel and Cain, and they brought sacrifices to the Lord. Um, we know that uh, Abel gave animal sacrifices, whereas Cain brought uh, uh, like plants and you know vegetation. So he brought that as a sacrifice. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was rejected. But you see, the Spirit of God is speaking up about Abel centuries later so this tells us something when we live by faith right the spirit of god found it necessary to talk about an act of a person which was done by faith okay only one thing we know about Abel. what did he do he gave god a sacrifice but it is so important that he has been listed among those elders who have a testimony. And, uh, you know, we, we are learning from his life about how to have faith. So, uh, Abel, his testimony is that the sacrifice which he offered, it was not the quality, you know, meat, vegetables, that was not the comparison. But why is God calling his sacrifice more excellent? There is an ingredient. What is that ingredient? Faith. Okay. And God knows the hearts of people, right? So God has noticed this in what Abel did. He did only one thing. And that one thing blessed God because it was done by faith. And that really challenges us today. Because uh, we do so many things for God, right? We do so many things in the name of God. 
But what is the spirit of God telling us? See, what is done by faith is the excellent sacrifice which God receives and God remembers. And so whatever we do, whatever we do, let it be done through faith. That's the lesson that we learn from the life of Abel. And uh, notice the last portion of that verse it also says, God testifying of his gifts because God appreciated the gift offered by faith. And through it, he being dead still speaks. He dead at God. But here's another lesson for us. The works of faith are a legacy. Something that they, they offer the existing world, okay, uh, that they'll continue to minister. The works of faith can continue to minister even when we are dead and gone. Because that's the power of the kind of uh, sacrifice or the gift that we offer in faith. Uh, what a you know, blessed truth for us to learn from the life of Abel. The Spirit of God thought it was important to speak to us about acts of faith, gifts of faith, sacrifices of faith. Okay, let's move ahead. Let's uh, read from verses 5 and 6. Could somebody read, please? By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amin. So we uh, saw that Abel had faith. Now who's the next person who had faith? Enoch had faith in God. Enoch trusted God. And he uh, heard that his testimony was that he pleased God. How much did he please God? You know, it's always a mystery. People talk about Enoch. There are extra biblical reports about Enoch. And we don't know how far it's true. Uh, but uh, you see, what the Bible is telling us is that the relationship that Enoch had with God, it was so, uh, so pleasing to God that God just took him. Like, you know, he just walked with God. That's what the Bible says. So he walked on with God. Uh, remember we said, for it is appointed for man to taste death once and after which is judgment in Hebrews 9.27. But notice here, uh, there is a man who did not even taste death because God was so pleased with his fellowship that uh, he even let him you know, move past uh, death. And uh, so that again is an encouragement for us to know that we must have faith in God. We must walk closely with God. And uh, uh, what is it that pleases God? We all ask the question, if I want to make God happy, uh, how should I live? So the key is given in verse 6 over here, faith. When we have faith in our hearts, when we have faith in our walk with the Lord, we can please Him. But if there is no faith, for without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So what does God look for? God looks for faith. And faith is what makes our relationship with God, uh, you know, uh, 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 so for God, it's a pleasing one. Uh, and, you know, we, we notice He's encouraging the believers, the, the writer here. He says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we have faith in who God is. We have faith that he is just, uh, you know, he will not uh, sort of uh, forget about. Remember, even earlier he said, God will not forget uh, your labor, which which you have uh, uh, put forth for his people. So God is not unjust. We need to have faith in who he is and the fact that he is not unjust to us. And he says, for one who comes to God must believe. It's always amazing uh, to me that we call people who are born again as believers. Okay, Because that is our primary job. Believe. If we don't believe, then what kind of believers are we? But here in this passage, 
the writer is saying uh, that he who comes to God must believe. So faith, belief is is very key in our relationship with God, and uh, that is what will please God. And surely God will also reward us when we diligently seek Him. So let's move ahead. Verse seven here. We we'll talk about Noah. By faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he con condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Amen. So uh, you see, these people did not exist um, after Jesus, uh, you know, did the work of redemption. But they were walking in some of these truths early on, and that uh, obviously we know that's the work of the Spirit of God. Uh, so Noah, how did he live? You know, divinely warned of things not yet come, and we all know his story. He built an ark. At a time when people did not know what is rain, okay, so uh, he should have been a man of faith to do that, to take the blueprint from God and everyone mocking, laughing at him. But uh, there's no concept of rain. There's no, con I mean, there's no concept of uh, a flood, nothing like that. But here is here is Noah building an ark, a man of faith, uh, and he was moved with godly fear. See that connection, faith. Uh, is connected to God in our lives. We do the things that uh, God wants us to do. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household. And also, in, in the saving uh, ark for the saving of the household, it's again a shadow. You know, this, this particular uh, uh, action of Noah, it's a shadow of what Jesus has done. Salvation. It's a shadow of salvation. So even Jesus has prepared something. What is that? He's prepared salvation for us, right? Uh, and, and so you know, we can compare these two. And we are told he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So when Noah lived, he became the heir of righteousness. How is that possible? Jesus has not yet come. But again, you know, if in the shadow, you, you could say. Uh, he had some knowledge of putting his faith in God and experiencing righteousness that comes through believing uh, God. Okay? And uh, it, it says that he condemned the world. How did he condemn the world? We don't see uh, necessarily <laughs> in the Bible uh, Noah going and shouting at people or you know calling people names. But he was obedient to God. So when Noah was obedient to God, that in itself was like a judgment on the people around where they were not ready to believe but they probably would have had a sense of hey this guy is right you know uh, maybe we should listen to him so that condemnation is is more uh, from a righteous man living his own life right that the, the people may have had that sense of um, uh, that you know we are not walking right with god being alerted uh, to uh, obedience or disobedience towards God. So that's a little bit about Noah. Uh, now we'll move on to the father of uh, the faith. We'll talk about Abraham. Uh, let's read from uh, verse 8 to verse 12, please. Shall I read, ma'am? My faith. Uh, okay, so uh, shall we, uh, Christopher, could you read the next section? I'll... Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, right. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sister, please go ahead. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has no has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. 
by faith sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore thank you thank you sister so uh, this is shedding light on how the impossible was made possible because of faith abraham uh, definitely he would have required faith to go where god told him to go an unknown um, land that god was calling him to he did not know where he is headed but he went anyway and it takes faith to follow after god sometimes we don't know what the future holds what exactly is going to happen but when we act on the instruction of god what does that demonstrate like abraham it demonstrates faith so by faith he went even when he did not know where he was going and he tarried he waited for the fulfillment of god's promises and so that picture is painted in verses 9 and 10 where we are told that he dwelt in a land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob so there was a promise god told him look this is the portion of land that i'm going to give you but it didn't happen immediately and so he was partnering with the next generation so that much waiting was going on so it was not just the promise of Isaac being born that uh, Abraham waited for but he was waiting for the promise of the land and uh, you know many descendants god spoke so many things to Abraham and he was partnering with the next generation even to see the fulfillment of god's promises uh, and in verse 10 you know, it brings a spiritual angle it says he waited for the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is god so we know technically that the land of israel right the boundaries of israel is what god was speaking to uh, when he gave a promise to abraham but the author now is just like moses how moses had uh, sorry noah he had that sense of righteousness through faith right abraham had a sense of the city of god right we, we know that uh, uh, there's going to be the rule and reign of jesus in the in the millennium and then you know uh, 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 like ezekiel 37 it, it talks about uh, that temple where where uh, jesus is is worship uh, and uh, you know the the river surrounding it and all that. so this is way to the future the, the the things that are going to be fulfilled later on uh, because these were men who were walking with god people who were walking with god and um, you know they they walked with faith god gave them understanding of uh, very many amazing things to come okay so that is what he's referring to so abraham his his heart was not just for that piece of land but much more than that much more that god will bring forth to jesus you know in future and uh, all his people can enjoy that dwelling with god and so that is the testimony of abraham and sarah of course you know we see her journey where it is said that she was old right that we know that uh, naturally that was not the appropriate time for her to bear a child but god made it happen so the impossible happened how did it happen the impossible happened through faith so it said sarah received strength to conceive seed so when there is faith you know there is a capacity to uh, do the impossible and it happened in sarah's body she bore a child when she was past the age it says because she judged him faithful who had promised so faith faith we keep saying faith 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 in god faith in god faith in what he has spoken and that's what we are talking about and then you know it talks about the testimony of this couple where it says what uh, as a, as a couple what what has happened you know finally god has blessed them uh, god has blessed them given them descendants uh, multitudes innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore 
Now, another point that I want to share with us is that, uh, yes, these people have seen the fulfillment of God's promises, but were they perfect? Is that why uh, God, God you know, made it happen for them? Well, they obviously were not perfect, right? We know about the life of Abraham. He made some mistakes along the way. He, you know, thought that, okay, maybe through Haga is, is what God will do. He, so he listened to Sarah. Sarah laughed at the promise of God. But even though there are these shortcomings, the good thing is they repented and they came back. They aligned themselves to the uh, work of God. And then it happened. So it's not that these people were perfect, but what are we looking at? We are focusing on how their lives, you know, uh, uh, bore fruit when they walked in faith, when they were obedient to God, when they trusted God, when they depended on God. Even the impossible happened. And that's a lesson for us. God can work through us. Yes, we may make mistakes, but when we align ourselves, it is still possible for God to, uh, you know, make things happen, breakthroughs to come by. Okay, So let's move on. Let's uh, read now verses 13 through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity, opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Amen. So as I pointed out earlier, the promise which they received was greater than an earthly promise of a, a land here. Uh, and, and so you know, it's talking about these men and women. And it's uh, saying that they had lives of faith. And what do lives of faith look like? Uh, so. There are some phrases here, such as, saw the promises afar off. So even for us today, maybe we're trusting God for healing, we're trusting God for a, a, a child who has wandered away to come back to, to uh, God and you know, change their life. Uh, we're trusting God for uh, restoration in our, in our families. We see the promises, they are afar off, but at least we see them. So we, we see uh, what those promises are and we not uh, faith senses, we can see God fulfilling them. That's how these people, they saw them. The promises are far off. And what else? They were assured of them. That's the light of faith. Yes, God will do. Today, I'm assured, isn't it? So faith is, is not about what is visible. Then we don't need faith. But faith is about the invisible, what is yet to come. And that is why the term hope is used there. Because we only hope for things which we do not yet see. And these people, they were assured of the things that were to come. So they saw from afar off. They were assured of them. Then what else? It says they embraced them. Meaning they were not doubtful of the promises of God. Rather, they delighted in the promises of God. And that's the way in which they waited. And the next thing that they did was they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the land. So God gave them that understanding that, yes, there's a natural fulfillment, but there's even a spiritual fulfillment. And so while, uh, particularly in Abraham's situation, uh, he never really inherited the, the land that was promised to him. It was you know his uh, the descendants who came after him who technically kind of you know moved into the promised land and, and uh, um, all of that. So that whole inheriting in its fullness, Abraham did not really experience it. But in a spiritual sense, there was other greater things that you know, he was really looking forward to. So uh, a couple of uh, phrases that are helpful for us today. 
saw the promises from afar, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed. So even we can do that. We can assure, we can embrace, we can confess. Okay? So that's the way in which we live a life of faith. Now, um, okay, let's uh, try. We'll, we'll read verses 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, of heard of Isaac, and he who had received the promise was in the act of offering of his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be made. I think this we all understand that uh, it obviously took. Uh, Abraham, it, it took faith on Abraham's part to uh, go and offer Isaac. Uh, now we see, you know, parallelly Romans uh, chapter 4, uh, and over there in verse 17, it says that uh, God, he, he's a God who calls those things that do not exist as though they did. So, what is the faith that Abraham carried? Carried the faith that yes, God promised descendants through Isaac, his word shall not fail. Now, God is calling me to sacrifice Isaac, but he still has to fulfill his promise of descendants. So, if Isaac remained dead, so Abraham even believed. See, only God knows the condition of Abraham's heart, and God is speaking after he's dead at God. So, Abraham. In those moments, believed that Isaac can even be brought back to life. That's the God he served. So that was his faith, a faith that believed even for resurrection. Okay? Uh, and wow, what, what a faith Abraham carried. Let's quickly read verses 20 and 21, please. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Okay. So, yeah, Isaac talks about Isaac. Uh, he blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Um, so, obviously, you know, Isaac was not going to uh, be there to see the fulfillment of of those blessings which he pronounced on his sons. But then uh, we notice that it took faith right, to pronounce those blessings, that those blessings which will manifest in the future. So that's what it is talking about over here. And uh, um, verse 21, we read about Jacob. Uh, he was dying, blessed each of his sons of Joseph and worship leaning on the top of his staff. So similarly, even to pronounce blessing on the offspring and descendants, it says that these men, they did it by faith. They trusted God. Okay, I'm blessing you. This will be fulfilled because my God will make it happen. So they carried that faith when they prayed for their children, for when they prayed for their descendants. So even Jacob did that. Uh, he blessed uh, each of the sons of Joseph, it says. And also, you know, we can talk more about this and I'll get into uh, other details. Things like, you know, how the Bible says, Jacob, I have loved, and um, uh, Esau, I have hated. So uh, whether Isaac thought about it or not, he loved Esau. But the blessing ultimately went to Jacob. So what God wanted happened. Okay, um, that's also amazing. How did it happen? I know that Jacob didn't do things in a, in a very right way, but then uh, the blessings went to the person who God wanted to bless. Okay, Something strange that took place there. And uh, in the case of Jacob, we, we are told that uh, uh, um, when he was dying, he blessed his sons and also another uh, small detail, leaning on the top of his staff. So you know, some commentators say that leaning uh, is uh, referring to the limp that he developed, right? Genesis 32, when he wrestled with God. So uh, that talks about how close his relationship with 
God was. So let's stop here. In the next uh, class, what we'll do is we will hopefully co uh, complete um, Hebrews. Uh, I, I'll try to complete it in the first hour so that in the second hour we can uh, move on to other books of the Bible. They are smaller books, and so we'll go faster in them. So I would like to request somebody to please pray, and uh, we can wrap up today's session. Ma'am, shall I, I pray? Yes, please, sister. Uh, one one thing I just wanted to share while sure. sharing about uh, Sarah laughter. In uh, Genesis 17, 17, we read, Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So we see two contexts. That's why I think God uh, has a, a sense of humor and uh, called Isaac the child of laughter. Because both the parents, they were in a stage where uh, it was physically impossible. But God gave them that faith and they carried on. Thank you, ma'am. I just wanted to add because sometimes we forget Abraham also laughed. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, sister. Thank you. That, that uh, really... Uh, uh, good to know that people have failed and still God has worked through their lives. I don't think it is a failing because they are the pioneers of faith. They don't have anything to fall back on. No church, no books, no con nothing. They were pioneers. They were just learning to walk in faith. So God, I think, gently uh, taught them faith and gave them that. I think so. Because they were just starting. They, they don't have anyone to fall back on. I That's think so. Yeah. I think we have more resources and better understanding. Yeah, we all, yeah, yeah. I'll just pray, ma'am. Thank you, Father. We come to your throne of grace with thanksgiving and praise. Thank you for the author and finisher of our faith, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the gift of faith for opening our eyes of understanding to see you, Lord, for the grace you have given us to, Father, to fall down before you and receive the gift of salvation and all the blessings you have given us in the name of Jesus. I thank and praise you, Master, that you are teaching us wonderful insights from the book of Hebrews. Let those truths be ingrained in us, Lord God, and increase our faith that we may be pleasing through our faith in your sight, Lord God. Bless each one of us, our ma'am, and each one of us. Strengthen us in your faith, Lord. Bind us with more of your love and give us your grace and purpose to fulfill what you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ma'am. Amen. Thank you, sister. Thank you, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the book of Hebrews. Uh, please continue to pray that uh, God will help us learn much more. And uh, uh, yeah, and please pray that we finish the portions on time as well. Okay. Bye for now. Have a blessed weekend. Bye. God bless. Uh, Pastor, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Prabhakar. Uh, everyone can leave. Okay. Those who want to leave can leave, please. Uh, yes, Prabhakar. Let's tell me. Pastor, I was asking uh, the questions uh, that has been posted yes. and uh, has written like 500 words or more. So I'm like uh -huh. wondering, cumulatively, it's 500 words or more or uh, single points um, containing 500. No, no, no. Uh, cumulative. Uh, cumulatively. Okay, Pastor. So so if it is, if it will exceed 500 uh, words, is it okay or? Yeah, it's fine. I, so that's why I put 500 or more. Some people like yeah. to write pages. So you're free okay. to, if you want to. Okay, boss. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Thank you.